Cool. Good morning, everyone. My name is Madeline. Um, I'm the Communications and Office Assistant at 360 Consult. Um, so today I'm just going to help our panellists um, get through just what they're going to discuss and, you know, also help answer your questions the best we can. Hi, my name is Robin Commons. I'm a Senior Associate at 360 Consult. I've been doing consulting, HR consulting for many years. Um, today I'm presenting on health and safety working from home um, and that, area, that is one of my specialist areas but I also cover all the others as well. Hello everyone, my name is Lynn Booker and I'm one of the Senior Associates at 360 Consult. I'm also uh, a mediator and part of the conflict resolution team. I'm really happy to be part of the um, team today presenting to you on um, all the questions you must have about uh, level three and um, employees coming back into the workplace and what you have to do as an employer. So happy to, to talk to you today. And um, thanks Lynn, my name's Cam Goulet. I'm part of the employment, uh, the dispute resolution team along with Lynn and uh, Robin and work in the conflict management side of the, the business, recently qualified as a mediator, so that's where my bent is. And uh, also as a duty old ex-policeman for my sins, um, work in the uh, employment investigations field. So normally get to see a dispute when it, it rises to the surface and, uh, and where the problems already become pretty messy and, and sort of, uh, Duty for both sides. So um, hopefully by going through this webinar today, we can help you head some of these problems off of the past, um, get in front of them and uh, work away towards as smooth a possible transition into level two and uh, business as usual for your business. So I think Maddie was going to share the slides with us and we'll talk through there. So look, just uh, these will be quite broad um, comments. So they might not apply specifically to your business. So please use the chat function, um, Q&A function, send your questions through and if need be we'll come back to you individually with some of your specific needs um, as part of this, this process. So probably sort of a generational um, nod here to Star Trek Life Gym but not as we know it. Level three the next frontier and, and beyond. So we're on level three now. Uh, heard various people so if um, you're able to open under level three, you're possibly hard at work now, not watching this till you come back and um, back from your workplace and, and can look at it a bit later on. So who can open? Business that can operate safely. That's the key to this whole thing is operating safely and you won't have customers come into or onto your premises and you can do contact trade. So you know, these, are, these are things that are barriers to some businesses and will be working hard at the background to get them up and, and in place today. So hopefully you are, uh, if you're in a position to work, you can be working today and um, starting to make that transition. If not, you'll be waiting for level two before you can go back to work. So um, if we just move on to the next slide, Maddie. So what needs to happen next for your business? Now, as we said earlier, we're an employment relations company. So it's about employment, it's about relations. And the key part of that is relationships. The relationships that you have with your employees and uh, we all know that for a good uh, relationship to flourish, you need to communicate. In communication, we think there's been a lot of information and probably a lot of your employees are um, suffering from a little bit of information overload. So what we would suggest is that this is one of the things that you can manage out of this whole situation. A lot of things have been imposed upon you as a business. Um, a lot of information has come from a lot of different sources but this is part of the communication. You can control the message back to your employees. And uh, if you've got unionized employees, they should be part of that communication conversation and how you will manage the return to work under the level three conditions. So we're on level three today, that's probably happened already. But if you're moving to level two, the same communication applies to your business. What is your plan? What do you think business as usual will look like? How have you communicated that to your employees? Now, your employees are the, probably both hands, the most simple and most complex of your capital, the human capital. Uh, I think you won't have to look too far to find examples of, uh, you know, people don't all think the same way as you do. They don't hear the same things that you say to them. So, and part of that communication noise, what is the message you're sending to them? How are they receiving that message? And how are you, then capturing that you've sent a message and what your expectations are. So, you know, there's plenty of good examples of where um, yeah, people have used text messaging, um, 
emails, online messaging, people are using Zoom at the moment. You can resort, record Zoom conversations. So how are you managing that um, you can, and this, this is me looking at the dispute resolution sort of hat on, that um, in hindsight, when you're looking back and somebody's challenging um, a decision made or, or some instructions you've passed out and you're relying on that um, as part of your explanation of why you did a certain course of action, um, how did you record it? Did you follow up a verbal conversation with an email, a text message? Um, was it part of a Zoom conversation to a wider group that was recorded and can be referred to later on? So, so these are sort of things that um, considering, you know, what is your plan? That's, that's a key tenant to this, that you do have a plan and we'll move on to that shortly. Uh, with Lynn, we'll start um, yeah, talking through some of the things you should be considering and, and how you make that plan. But um, secondly is we don't all communicate the same way. Sometimes, you know, people like verbal, some people like written, there's communication noise where the music and the, the music, I'm hearing music, where the, the message gets confused as it goes along. There is no music in the background, it's all inside my head. But that sort of thing, there's a lot of people that are being influenced by outside factors um, and uh, that a key part of this communication is what you say, how you deliver it, how you record it. And, um, but I don't think at this stage we can emphasize enough that you should be communicating with your employees and how it will impact your business and then how it will impact them. So look, I might pass on to Lynn now to um, talk through some of the things you should be considering and um, then we'll expand on these as we go through some of the other slides and they may help generate some questions you have for us. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Cam. So good morning, everyone. Um, look, this, um, these slides are really just touching on things that we're going to talk about um, in depth later on in the webinar. But um, we turn our mind to the things that you must be facing as an employer at the moment. Going back into level three, you know, we know employees are allowed back to work. But the first question on your mind will probably be how much work do we have you know how much work is there to do what types of work are there and who are the the employees that we need back at work you might not need the whole workforce you might just need a select group of people so who do you want back at work and who do you need back at work and then with that you know comes all those questions what happens if an employee doesn't want to come back to work um, then I guess you need to think about so what you know what do I have to pay them um, nothing nothing has changed when an employee comes back to work they must be paid for every hour that they work and if you reduce their hourly rate or if you reduce their hours of work just like um, changes to any terms and conditions that must be done in consultation so you need to have a conversation with that employee discuss the situation you find yourself in and see if you can reach an agreement. Safe operating procedures, look Robin is our health and safety expert, um, but you know there'll be things that you are thinking about with you know what does a plan look like, you know, um, and, and Robin's going to talk about that in depth in the, in the next lot of slides. Um, as an employer, you know, you, you, you don't often have to think about how your employees are going to get to work. You know that they're going to turn up at a certain time and leave at a certain time, and the expectation is that they get there. But certainly we're in um, strange times with COVID-19, and you do need to now think, turn your mind to how is, how is this employee going to get to and from work. Have those conversations with your um, with your team and um, and find out you know if they if they need anything special if they need anything particular and you need to make any accommodations for that um, there will also be employees who have got children and um, they will have to make arrangements for childcare and this may have an impact on their ability to get to work at a certain time or get to work at all so um, we'll have we'll talk about that a bit more as we go through the slides but that will be um, a real um, you know a real difficulty for some people who do have have children um, again you know what are you going to do if an employee just says to you um, 
you know, I, I don't want to come back to work. I don't feel safe or I don't want to come back to work because I have um, a parent living with me who's over 70 or I have an underlying health issue. So what do you do then? And we'll talk about that as we go through. So they're, they're the questions we thought would be sort of, um, hitting you in the face right now, things that you would be thinking about as an employer. If there's any other questions, you know, um, put those through on the Q&A, but that's what we're going to go over in the next slides. So Robin, I think I'm just handing over to you for the next slide to talk about um, safe operating procedures. Robin, you're on mute. Thanks. Sorry, the Health and Safety at Work Act is still very much um, out there. So again, no legislation has been changed during this process. So we still have to follow the normal health and safety procedures that you would be following normally. But what you also need to overlay is what difference has the level three. And if you're not going back to work in level three, then you'll have time to look at what's happening, going to happen in level two. Um, once you've decided, as Lynn and, and Cam have, have um, set out, once you've decided what work you have available, who's going to be coming to work and how they're going to get there, then how are you going to operate things once they get to work? Um, so the um, WorkSafe have got some really good information on their website. Um, but you need to think about things are, um, what are the risks of restarting your business. So you've got your normal risks, your hazards that you've identified, but what are the new risks that are going to come in? If people are moving machinery around, they're lifting. So what, what safety equipment do you need to give them that's different to what you normally have because they're doing lifting of heavy, heavy machinery? You may not be able to move it. It might not be safe to move it. Um, how are you ensure that all um, workers know how um, to keep themselves safe from being exposed to COVID-19. How will you gather information? Because um, the government is saying that you need to gather um, contact information for anybody in your workplace, um, for all your employees. So um, you may be able to use your visit, your normal visitor system um, that may collect that information for you anyway. But if it doesn't, then how do you need to expand that to make sure that you're capturing that contact information? Um, how will you manage exposure or, ex or suspected exposure to COVID-19? What systems have you got in place for testing people? Um, how will you evaluate and con continuously review as you normally have to do with um, your health and safety systems and controls? What new controls do you need to put in place over and above your normal ones? Because these are not normal times. Um, and how will these changes impact how are these new hazards or these changes impact on the work that people are doing? So think about if, if you've changed their work, um, for instance, if um, they're now working in the warehouse, so you're doing online work, um, you're, not, um, you're not working normally, so you, you, you're um, able to do online. Um, but that means most people then have to be in the warehouse to get the goods out. So what risks are in the warehouse? What PPE do they need to use? What training do they need? Um, so it's, it's what you need to do to make sure that people are safe. Um, communication in this area is really key as well, as, as Cam's already um, identified. Um, the risk, what risk category are they in? Um, from a health and safety point of view, from COVID? Um, are they required to self-isolate? Um, have they been unwell? Have they got symptoms? Have they been unwell? Um, are they in a risk category? Um, are they unable to work for a related reason? Check industry guidance. So there's lots of really good stuff um, that the industries have put out. The MPI, obviously, and the Ministry of Health have some really good information out. But the individual industries, I know the New Zealand residential construction um, industry have got some good stuff out for, for construction companies going back. Um, and MTA have got some good stuff out for motor vehicle panel beaters and that sort of area. So look at your industry. Um, identify um, what personal protective equipment you need over and above the normal equipment. And as I said, if someone's doing something different, then they may need different PPE. Um, 
cleaning. Cleaning is really important. So how are you going to do your hygiene? Um, who's going to do it? What training do they need? What PPE do they need to do for that? Um, you may need to do daily health checks, um, taking temperatures and things. How will you do that? And, and all full of that information is on the Ministry of Health and MPI's websites. Um, if you're changing people's work patterns um, or the work they're doing, then what skills and abilities do they need and how will they do that work safely? So think about the changes in their work and what risks come with that. What skills do they need? Um, preparing training. So they, do they need to be trained to do those new skills or to use the PPE? If they're working in the warehouse, do they need that? No one can drive the forklift unless they have a license. So you need to manage who's using the equipment. Um, separation, so how are you going to um, manage the separation that needs, needs to happen, the two metre separation? And thinking about that, how is it going to be possible to do the work that you have with that separation? It might not be able, you might not be able to do it until level two. It might not be economical. You might not have enough people to do the processes. Um, Conduct pre-work checks. Um, so thinking about what people are going to do before they come to work and then have a think about what you're going to do, what hazards are they going to be exposed to, what new hazards and how you're going to manage those before they start work. So I know this is probably um, a bit late for a lot of people who have already started in level three, but I think it's never too late to go back and check you've got these things in place. You do need to make sure um, um, WorkSafe are still going to operate as they normally do, so if there's any, um, in, any um, issues with health and safety in relation to COVID-19, they're still going to follow those up. If there happens to be a death in your workplace as a result of someone con contracting uh, COVID-19, then they will do an investigation, they've said that. So um, it's, it's thinking about what you're going to do. And some of these systems and procedures may need to be put in place for some time, but then they might change when you go into level two. So you need to think about what you're going to be doing um, going forward. Um, WorkSafe have a really good safety plan on their website that covers off what will be done to manage risks, how will you ensure workers um, are keeping themselves safe, um, and so forth. So there's some good information on the system, and we can provide that to you if you can't find that. Um, uh, lastly, the vulnerable immunocompromised immu, workers. Um, again, you'll need to go through and find out from people if they have, if they're in that category, and there's a, there is a list of people who are in that category, um, and work through those systems with them. But that's a matter of getting information from them and communicating, consulting, and agreeing with them if that's the case and what you're going to do in that, in that instance. I think that's me finished. Oh, okay, working from home. So working from home, I mean, obviously, if, um, if you can work from home or your employees can work from home, you should continue to do that. Um, so, and if you've been doing that, then I'd look at how has that been working? Um, has it been working? Um, is it working from your, the employer's point of view? Is it working from the employee's point of view? We've had mixed response from employees. Um, some of them have loved being at home with their families and spending more time at home. Others have found it very frustrating trying to work in a busy family environment. So it's what's been working. So having a conversation with your employees about if you've been doing it already, how's that been working? Um, and if, you, if you're going to do it going forward, how will that work? Um, it may be that it hasn't been working very well um, and, you, and you need to make some changes. But you need to be... Um, clear when someone's working from home you still need to tell them what you want them to do what your expectations are and um, what the what you're going to um, judge them by um, from a performance point of view because we don't want to get six months down the track or two or three months down the track and you don't have the productivity that you need and the employee comes back to you and says well I don't know you wanted me to do that um, they need to know up front as they do normally what your expectations are and how they've changed um, Again, making sure that they're safe working from home. So set up ergonomically correctly. Have they got the right equipment? Have they got a proper desk? Hopefully they're not sitting on the bed. Um, they've got a proper chair. 
um, and they have an, an exit strategy to get out of the house if there's a fire, um, all those kind of things. So, and you need to know that in writing what they're actually doing. So there's a, there's a um, plan that we can give you um, and a policy if you need that. Um, so it's being very clear about what your um, expectations are of what they're going to be doing from home, the same as you would in the office. Um, again, communication comes into this as well. So you can't just lean across the desk um, and give them an instruction. So how are you going to give them instruction, work instructions? How are you going to um, communicate your expectations as to what they're going to be doing? Is it still a phone call? Is it a Zoom meeting? Is it an email? So how are you going to do that? And that might be different for different employees because everybody um, relates differently to how they're managed. So you may need to manage your staff differently than the way that you do in the office because it's not face-to-face. -face. So you need to understand what that is and work out between you what, um, what's going to work and what isn't. Um, the I, your individual employment agreements or your, or your, yeah, your employment agreements, you need to look at what you've got in there. Do you need to amend them? Um, do you need to consult on changes to the agreement about working from home as opposed to working in the office, changing their hours of work? What, what hours are they working from home? And how will you know what hours they're working from home? How will you check on that? Um, so what does that process look like and what have you discussed with your employee and agreed with them? So that in time, if you again, if you have performance issues with them, you have that um, in writing or an agreement of some sort and you've talked to them about it and they know what's expected. Also um, keeping in touch with the team, so working from home, um, people um, remote, they're lonely, um, they're scared, so are you keeping in touch with not only them on a personal basis but are you keeping the team together? Is the team meeting regularly? How are you doing that? Are you having regular morning teas still? checking in once a day or whatever you normally do. Um, it does that work from a working from home perspective. So what are you going to do um, going forward um, into level three and then into level two? Um, how from, um, the internet is also an issue working from home. Um, do people have good internet? Is it frustrating for them if they don't have good internet? How are you going to resolve that? Is it maybe they can't work from home. So if they can't work from home and they can't go into work, then what do you do? Again, it's a consultation with your employees working through that um, and, and getting an agreement. So I think that's... Um, Thank you, Robin. Yeah, I think um, we should move on to Lynn. Just I know we probably will have a few questions and Lynn can talk more about the people issues that are coming up. Um, thanks, Madeline. Um, so um, the, the, the first question, we've got more people than we've got work. Um, and, that, and that might happen, you know, businesses, some businesses might be um, uh, just warming up to getting back to full capacity and how it was before um, lockdown, um, and you're going to need less people. So, you know, you then have to say, well, what is the selection criteria? So as I said to you before, look at the work, look at who has the skills to do the work, and do you, you know, do you have enough people? It needs to have a, be a process, and you need to be transparent about that. So just like any process that as an employer that you would have run, any formal process, um, we talk about good faith. And I've, um, when I've talked at I ha Ice House before, people have said to me a lot, well, what the heck does good faith mean? And I always say, good faith is simple. It's good faith, if you think of it as a piece of plastic, so it's transparent. With a, when you've got a piece of plastic between you and me, you can see everything I'm doing, I can see everything you're doing. So that selection criteria and that process to get to the decision on who's coming back to work has to be transparent, has to be in good faith, and you have to be consulting with people. So find out how much work you've got, who do you need to do the work, and then you can, um, you can then select who needs to come back to work. If there's conversations about it's not fair, why them and not me, or why me and not them, have that good faith conversation to see if you can get to an agreement. There might be resistance to return to work under level three or two. Um, 
and but at the end of the day with any process that you go through there's um a reason a genuine reason you've thought about um the selection criteria the work to be done and who and you've consulted but at the end of that as an employer you are able to make a decision you're able to run your own business and you're able to decide based on all the information what the business needs certainly you have to be reasonable and i think robin's you know covered that really well about having those conversations where people are um, have got particular circumstances but once you go through that process you can then um try to get an agreement if you get an agreement um make sure you that is recorded somewhere because if it's just a verbal understanding that can um be misunderstood and it can come back to um be um be challenged so once you get an agreement follow that up with an email look it might even be short term um um, provisions that you're putting in place that you know um, if someone's doing some different tasks or someone's working shorter hours or someone's um, you know there's there's different um, arrangements but get them in writing make sure you get the term set down in writing um, and um, and consult and get agreement um, if you don't get agreement of course um, and I wonder, um, Madeline, I just need you to jump in here. Is that is that something I'm going to talk about if you don't get agreement? Or have we got that in another slide? Um, oh, no, I think this is our last slide. So if you want to spend like a minute talking about that, we could. So I think, too, a lot of, a lot of people have said to me, well, hold on, you know, I, I have had those. I have got work. I've identified what the work is. I need six people back. I've... I know who those six people are who have the skills, but actually three of them have said they don't want to come back or they can't come back. What do I do? Um, I guess that, um, you know, during lockdown and during um, this um, strange situation we find ourselves in, you know, there's been, we've been told, you know, we've got to, we've got to listen, we've got to get agreement, but crunch time can come where you just, as an employer can say, look, I've tried everything, done everything that 360 told me, but I haven't got agreement. This employee is just refusing to come back to work. And that could happen. And I think um, it's like the Employment Relations Act hasn't changed and you find yourself in the same situation as you would have if, this, if um, we weren't in level three or in level two. If you require an employee to come back to work, you've taken all practical steps to make sure it's a safe working environment and they refuse to come, you have two choices. You can require them to come, and if they don't come to work, you can enter into a formal process, which could be a disciplinary process. Or you can, if you can accommodate them, I guess you can put them on a period of leave without pay. But there's no requirement for an employer to continue a working from home or an employee being at home and not working. If there is work, they can come back to work. It is safe, but they refuse to do so. So if you can't get agreement of all else fails, you can enter into a formal process. I just encourage you, if you're not familiar with those formal processes, to get some advice. You know, um, and uh, you can always give us a ring and we'll assist you or walk you through that process. But it is important that, it is important that you get that right.